Hello, wonderful people, what's going on? It's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my cardiology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about disease of the pericardium, or the outer layer of the heart, such as acute pericarditis, pericardial effusion, chronic constrictive pericarditis, and more. Then we talked about disease of the myocardium, or the muscle layer of the heart, such as myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy, with all of its subtypes, as well as myocarditis. And also diseases that affect the endocardium of the heart, such as endocarditis. You'll find all of them in separate videos. As for today, we'll talk about a disease that affects all three layers, the endocardium and the myocardium and the pericardium, i.e. pancarditis. Pan means what? Extensive, inclusive, such as pancytopenia, which affects all of my blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Similarly, pancarditis means endocarditis plus myocarditis plus pericarditis. So is rheumatic fever only about fever and heart disease? No, we also have the rheumatic component, joint disease as well. It can also affect my skin, my nervous system, etc. So smash the like button, click the subscribe button, and let's get started. Here is my cardiology playlist. Please watch these videos in order. Back to basics, the wall of my heart is made of three layers. The inner one is the endocardium, the middle one is the myocardium, and the outer one is the pericardium. Endo means inner, myo means muscle, and peri means around. And that's why diseases that affect the heart include endocarditis, which affects my endocardium, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, myocardial infarction, all of them affect the myocardium. Then we have pericarditis, pericardial effusions, etc. They affect my pericardium. Where is rheumatic fever? Rheumatic fever affects all three layers, endocardium and myocardium and pericardium. So it's a pancarditis. If you want to learn about diseases of the pericardium, please refer to other videos in this playlist. You can download these doozy handwritten notes on my website, medicosisperfectionatis.com. I help you learn, understand, and pass exams. If you really want to understand rheumatic fever, bring a pen and paper and let's go to town. What are the risk factors of developing rheumatic fever? If I'm living in poverty, if I'm living in crowded area, or if I'm young, let's say between 5 years old and 15 years old. This is the demographic that gets acute rheumatic fever. How about the chronic rheumatic fever? Well, chronic rheumatic fever could happen to anyone, provided that I had acute rheumatic fever before, and it was not treated or was not treated properly, or failed to respond to treatment, and now I have chronic rheumatic fever. Other than these three risk factors, poverty, crowded areas, and being young, do I have genetic predisposition? Yes, if I have HLA, DR7, or HLA, DR53, I am genetically predisposed to develop rheumatic fever, which makes me more likely. I do not have to develop rheumatic fever, it just means that I am at a higher risk. Another risk factor, of course, is to be exposed to the group A beta hemolytic streptococcus bacteria, known as streptococcus pyogenes. And then what? Is rheumatic fever a bacterial infection? No, it's an immunological response to the bacteria. Big difference. So what kind of immunity are we talking? Are we talking innate immunity or adaptive immunity? The answer is both innate immunity and adaptive immunity. And when it comes to adaptive immunity, are we talking humoral immunity or cellular immunity? And the answer is also both. You will recall that humoral immunity is B cell immunity because the B cells will stop being so naive, they will grow the flip up and they will become plasma cells and the plasma cells will secrete antibodies into my bodily fluids, humors. That's why we call it humoral immunity. What do you mean by bodily fluids? Mostly your plasma, but also your mucous membrane in case of IgA antibody. As for T cell immunity or T lymphocyte immunity, this is cell mediated immunity, which is cell to cell killing. I do not need a mediator. I do not need an antibody to kill. I will kill myself. I'll use my own hands and I will not use a tool. Of course, all of what I said are metaphors, not premeditated murder, because there are some smart lawyers in the comments, always. How did my immune system go crazy and start to attack my own heart and my own joints and my own nervous system and my own skin? Well, 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 we'll recall from bacteriology or microbiology that group A beta hemolytic streptococcus has something called the matrix protein 
also known as M protein for short. And this M protein is virulent. It is vicious. This M protein is the target. My immune system is trying to attack that target. However, this M protein looks very similar to another protein on my heart. And it's not just my heart. It's also present in my nervous system as well as my joints, my skin, etc. So my immune system will start to attack my heart instead of attacking the actual M protein of the bacteria. It will attack my nerves, my joints, my skin. What do I call this phenomenon that my antigens look similar to the M protein? We call this molecular mimicry or cross reactivity. Instead of attacking this, I attacked these instead. So can we describe this as an autoimmune response? Sure, because I'm attacking myself. The word auto means self, as in automatic transmission. Self motion. And after I attack my heart and my nerves and my joints and my skin, what's gonna happen? Tissue injury will happen. And after I injure my own tissue, what's gonna happen? Some stuff will be released from the cell to the blood, and the blood has seen nothing like it before. So no antigens will arrive onto the scene. Then we'll have oligoclonal expansion and proliferation of reactive lymphocytes. Reactive against whom? Against myself. So you can call them autoreactive. All of my white blood cells are super active, so they will release cytokines and chemokines, etc. And before you know it, there is necrosis and cell death in the middle like this. And this will be surrounded by reactive histiocytosis. What's the histiocyte? Good old macrophage around the central necrosis. So fibrinoid necrosis in the center surrounded by those reactive histiocytes. What do we call this? This is called an Ashoff nodule or Ashoff body. The necrosis in the middle is fibrinoid necrosis, which is the necrosis seen in immunological reactions if you have studied pathology before. And these reactive histiocytes have a special name because the doofus who discovered them was called Anichkov. So we have two doofuses. Ashoff, that's the entire nodule, which has the necrosis in the middle, and the Anchkov reactive histiocytes around them. Hey, medicosis, these are not doofuses. These are good scientists. Have some respect for yourself. Yes, ma'am. Let me ask you a question. When you see reactive histiocytes around a central necrosis, what does that remind you of? The good old granuloma. And in granulomas, what kind of cell predominates? CD4 positive T lymphocyte. All of these are exam questions. They ask about this cell. It is CD4 T cell. They ask about the type of the necrosis. This is fibrinoid necrosis. They ask about the Ashoff body or Ashoff nodule and the Anchkov cells. The Ashoff body is the entire thing. Anchkov cells are reactive histiocytes around the fibrinoid necrosis. They also ask about molecular mimicry, cross reactivity, and the immune system involved. All of these are high yield. So what's gonna happen? I attacked my heart, I attacked my joints, I attacked my brain cells and my nervous system, I also attacked my skin. Now what? Now you're ready to tell me about the signs and symptoms. It's called rheumatic fever, so I'll have a fever. And what else? I'll have the Jones criteria. The Jones criteria include major criteria and minor criteria. Let's start with the major. Just write the word Jones like this. Look at the O, I replace it with a heart. What's the J? Joint disease. The joint disease is migratory, shifting. Let's say it started in my knee and then it went to my ankle and then disappeared from there and went to my hip and then disappeared from the hip and arrived at the shoulder. Oh, oh, it's migratory, it is shifting. Is it polyarthropathy or monoarthropathy? It's usually polyarthritis, which means it affects many joints. Okay, after the resolution of the rheumatic fever, will this leave me with a permanent joint deformity? The answer is no. Is this arthritis inflammatory or non-inflammatory? I've just told you about your immune cells. Of course, it's inflammatory. And this is the story of the J. How about the story of the heart shape? Oh, this is carditis, which means inflammation of the heart endocarditis, myocarditis, and pericarditis, which can leave me with symptoms of heart failure if it is so severe. How about the N, subcutaneous nodules that look similar to the nodules of rheumatoid arthritis? Are these painful or painless? Well, just like rheumatoid arthritis nodules, these are painless. How about the E, erythema marginatum? And the S is Sidenham's chorea, which will be the topic of the next video.
If you want to see more cardiology videos like this, drop a heart emoji in the comments. First, I started with pharyngitis. First, I started with pharyngitis caused by group A, beta hemolytic streptococcus. And then what? Two to four days after being exposed to this nasty bacterium, I developed sudden onset of fever, sore throat, and headache with exudative suppurative pharynx. Exudative means it contains exudate. What do you mean by exudate? I mean suppurative. It's pussy. It has pus. What are the pus cells? Neutrophils, of course, in my pharynx, okay? and then what all of this is infection and this infection will drain to the part that drains the entire head and neck which is cervical lymph nodes so i develop cervical lymphadenopathy are these painful or painless since this is an infection and not cancer they will be painful cervical lymphadenopathy so i'll have swollen lymph nodes in my neck and then what? Please pay attention to this because it's extremely important. The group A beta hemolytic streptococcus that causes pharyngitis can also later trigger a rheumatic fever in my heart and post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis in my kidney. However, if the streptococcus pyogenes caused skin infection, not pharyngitis, it's a different strain of group A beta hemolytic strep, and it can only trigger a glomerulonephritis, never a rheumatic fever. And this is super important. Which means, if you have a patient with acute rheumatic fever, where do you think the previous infection was? In the pharynx or on the skin? Answer, only in the pharynx. Because the skin infection caused by streptococcus can never trigger a rheumatic fever. It can only trigger glomerulonephritis. So let's draw this again. We have two different strains or two different subtypes of group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. The one that causes pharyngitis can later trigger a rheumatic fever or a post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. But the different strain or the different subtype of group A beta hemolytic streptococcus that causes skin infection, pyoderma, can only trigger glomerulonephritis and never rheumatic fever. Super important. Here is another important point. We said due to molecular mimicry and cross-reactivity, I will start to attack my heart, my nervous system, my skin, my joints, etc. And this is what? Oh, this is antigen antibody reaction on the surface of the cell. On the surface of the cell is cytotoxic. If it is cytotoxic, what kind of hypersensitivity is it? It's type 2. Remember we talked about the different types of hypersensitivity before in my pathology playlist? We have said that if it's cytotoxic, it's type 2. What do you mean? I mean I have an antigen antibody reacting with one another, kissing and hugging one another on the surface of a cell. Could be a heart cell, nerve cell, joint cell, skin cell, etc. And this is exactly what happens in type 2 hypersensitivity and this is what happens in acute rheumatic fever. Now, if you recall from my video on Streptococcus pyogenes, which is in my playlist titled Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, we have said that Streptococcus pyogenes or group A beta hemolytic Streptococcus can lead to many diseases. Many of them are suppurative and two of them are non-suppurative, meaning they are not caused by the bacteria itself, they are caused by an immunological reaction to a bacterial protein. And these two non-suppurative diseases are rheumatic fever and post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And that's why they are not infectious, which means if you have rheumatic fever, you cannot transmit it to me. Conversely, if you have pharyngitis and you sneeze and cough in my face, of course I can contract the infection because these are suppurative, these are infectious, and they include pharyngitis, scarlet fever, pyoderma or skin infection, among others. Why is the streptococcus pyogenes so virulent and so vile? Because it has many structural components such as the infamous matrix protein or M protein, which binds the FC portion of my immunoglobulin and inhibits phagocytosis. It enables this bacterium to survive and not be targeted and killed by my immune system. This bacterium also has toxins as well as enzymes such as streptolysin S, streptolysin O, also known as hemolysin, as well as DNAs known as streptozyme. All of these virulence factors were discussed in my microbiology and infectious diseases playlist. Remind me again, what are the major Jones criteria? I have joint disease, I have carditis, endocarditis, myocarditis, and pericarditis. I have 
N. Subcutaneous nodules that are painless and erythema marginatum as well as Sydenham's chorea. Also known as chorea minor as opposed to what? Of Huntington disease which is Korea major. Sydenham Korea is also known as St. Vitus Dance. Let's talk about the matrix protein or the M protein of Streptococcus pyogenes. We have two types of this M protein. There is class 1 and there is class 2. Class 2 is too shy. It is unexposed. But class 1 is exposed. And since it's exposed, it can be attacked by my immune system. While trying to attack this exposed class 1 M protein, I ended up attacking my own heart and my own joints, etc. So rheumatic fever is what? Non-infectious, non-suppurative complication of streptococcus pharyngitis caused by group A, beta hemolytic streptococcus or streptococcus pyogenes. Both are two names for the same organism. Okay, my immune system is triggered because of what? Because of class 1, i.e. the exposed M protein, which subtypes 1, 3, 5, 6, and 18. Demographics. Usually, acute traumatic fever happens in children between age 5 and age 15, usually during the winter or autumn. I develop what? Sore throat, which is severe. Then, two to four weeks later, there is strong antibody response, molecular mimicry. I start to cross-react against my heart, against my joints, against my nerves, etc. And since I am attacking a cell, it's Psi2 toxic, which is type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. I develop the major Jones criteria, J, joint disease, the heart is carditis, it's pancarditis to be specific, the N is for subcutaneous nodules, and E is erythema marginatum, and S is Sydenham's chorea. How do I know that this disease was caused by my immune reaction against the streptococcal proteins? Well, you measure serum antibodies for ASO and anti-DNAs anti-streptolysin O antibodies and anti-DNAs B antibodies because these are my antibodies trying to attack the bacterial antigens. This is streptolysin O antigen which is hemolysin that belongs to this group A beta hemolytic streptococcus and this is DNAs B or streptozyme also belongs to group A beta hemolytic strept. Group A beta hemolytic streptococcus like any streptococcus is gram positive and that's why we give penicillin. Let's dig deeper. You see the J-O-N-E-S. These are the major Jones criteria. But we also have minor criteria, such as what? Such as having a fever, which is not very specific. Such as elevation of ESR and CRP, also non-specific. That's why they're called minor criteria. Joint pain. Uh, okay, anyone can have joint pain. How about absolute neutrophilic leukocytosis? Any person with bacterial infection will have this. That's why they are minor criteria. And prolonged PR interval. Well, any person with first degree heart block will have this. They are not super specific. That's why we call them minor criteria. But look at the major criteria. Joint disease that has some specifications. It is severe joint disease that lasts for one week and disappears after three to four weeks. It is migratory and shifting. It jumps from the hip to the knee to the shoulder to the elbow, etc. It is inflammatory and it's usually polyarthritis, which means many joints, although in some cases it could be monoarthritis. It affects large joints, knee, ankle, wrist, and not smaller joints like the joints in my fingers. Does it cause pain? Of course, it's inflammatory. Does this pain resolve? Yeah, it responds beautifully to aspirin. Ooh, and this is a specific characteristic of the joint disease of rheumatic fever. And after this joint disease is gone, it's not gonna leave me with permanent joint deformity. By the way, what are the most common symptoms in rheumatic fever? If you say heart disease, you're incorrect. Actually, joint disease is way more common than heart disease in patients with rheumatic fever. Three quarters of patients with rheumatic fever have joint disease. Next, carditis, pancarditis, the most serious complication, but not the most common complication. I have endocarditis, myocarditis, and pericarditis. Okay, endocarditis involves the endocardium and the heart valves. Which valves? Mitral valve is involved more commonly than the aortic, which is involved more commonly than the tricuspid. Okay, let's say that I have mitral heart disease now because of rheumatic fever. This mitral valve disease, will it be a regurgitating murmur, mitral regurg, or mitral stenosis? Well, if it's acute rheumatic fever, look at the U. It's more likely to be a regurg murmur, so mitral regurgitation. But if it's chronic, it's going to be stenotic. 
Acute is regurg and chronic is stenotic. Chronic is stenotic. Next, myocarditis. I'm attacking my cardiac myosin and my cardiac sarcolemin membrane proteins. This is molecular mimicry. And I lead to pericarditis, usually fibrinous pericarditis. Could have a friction rub or could have no friction rub. Next, nodules. In about 10% of patients, similar to rheumatoid arthritis nodules, they are under the skin, they are on the extensor surface of the forearm, such as the elbow. Inside them, there is fibrinoid necrosis. These are painless. Do they have to be on the extensor surface of the forearm? No, they also could be on top of bony prominences, like my skull. Next is erythema marginatum. What does erythema mean? Uh, erythro means red, as in erythrocyte. So I have redness. Marginatum, look at this. I'm creating a margin. And the center is more clear and more pale. Oh, so it looks like this. Basically, it looks like a ring. And the edge of the ring is red. But the center of the ring is more pale or clear. That's why we call it erythema marginatum. Circular rings, not just one, but many. Pink in color usually on the trunk or the limbs of the patient. Next, we have Sydenham chorea. We'll talk about it in great detail in the next video. What are the complications of rheumatic fever? Well, 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 it can affect my heart muscles, of course, because it leads to pancarditis, and I can end up with first-degree atrioventricular block or first-degree heart block, bradycardia. Take it to the next level, and it leads to heart failure, which is the most common cause of death in patient with rheumatic fever, which is heart failure. And then those vegetations on my valves can embolize and go somewhere else. When the vegetations are on the heart, since this is not a bacterial infection but an immunological response to a bacterial protein, the vegetations on the surface of the valve are not suburative, not infected, they are sterile vegetations. However, when they embolize and go somewhere else, they might get infected on their way. Another complication of acute traumatic fever is that it can become chronic, and chronic is stenotic. So let's summarize everything on rheumatic fever in one slide. History. Living in crowded areas, living in poverty, being young are risk factors. Having HLA-DR7 is a risk factor. Having HLA-DR53 is a risk factor. Also in the United States, living in Salt Lake City, Utah is a risk factor, and it's not very clear why. This disease tends to be relatively more common in Salt Lake City. This is type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. It is molecular mimicry cross-reactivity against the M protein of streptococcus pyogenes. I develop acute traumatic fever. Two to four weeks after the pharyngitis. So pharyngitis first, then two to four weeks later, I can develop acute traumatic fever. If I now have acute traumatic fever and you decided to perform a throat culture, on my pharynx, you will find it positive in only 25% of cases, which means most patients will be negative in their throat by then, proving that it's not the bacteria, but my immunological reaction to the bacterial protein. Big difference. Then we have the Jones criteria here, major and minor, acute is regurg, chronic is stenotic, never forget this. How can I diagnose it? Clinically, if you can give me two major criteria of the Jones criteria, for example, joint disease and heart disease, this is confirmatory. But what if I only found one major criterion? If you have one major and two minor, this can also confirm the diagnosis of rheumatic fever. Also, don't forget to order the ASO and the DNAs. If the ASO titer is greater than 400 Todd units, it's a positive test. DNAs is not as reliable as ASO. Let's do an EKG. You'll find PR prolongation. Why? First degree heart block. I mean, look at the carditis. It involved all the layers of the heart. Let's do a chest X-ray. Since it's a pancarditis, all of the heart is inflamed. I'll see enlarged cardiac silhouette on chest X-ray. Let's do an echo. Valvular heart disease. What kind of valvular heart disease are we talking? If it's acute, expect mitral regurge or tricuspid regurge or any regurge. But if it's chronic, it is stenotic. How about post-mortem biopsy or autopsy? You'll find vegetations on the valves. Okay, are they infected or sterile? They are sterile because this disease is an immunological reaction to a bacterial protein and not a bacterial infection. Where will I find the vegetations? Along the line of closure of the valve because this is where you find the greatest amount of turbulence. And the greater the blood turbulence, the greater the arrival of the immune cells. 
Under the microscope, you'll find the HOF bodies, which are central fibrinoid necrosis areas surrounded by reactive histiocytes known as Enchkov cells. How can I prevent rheumatic fever? Well, once I develop this bacterial pharyngitis caused by group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, it's time to take penicillin. If you take penicillin early on, you will avert this crisis. But let's say I did not, and now I'm stuck with acute rheumatic fever. What should I do? Antibiotics, which one? Usually penicillin, mostly penicillin G, but penicillin V can work as well. And usually for a long term, how long it depends on the case and the guidelines are complicated. What if I'm allergic to penicillin? Take erythromycin then. And for the joint disease, because it hurts and because it responds to aspirin, take aspirin for the joint pain. What if I have carditis? Sometimes glucocorticoids alleviate the symptoms because glucocorticoids are anti-immunity and anti-inflammatory. In the next video, we'll talk about Sydenham Korea, also known as Korea Minor or St. Vitus Dance. Quick review on ASO. Anti-streptolysin O. What is streptolysin? It's a hemolysin that belongs to the streptococcus. And this is my antibody against this antigen. Of course, if you studied microbiology, you will recall that streptococcus pyogenes is beta-hemolytic. It causes complete hemolysis on the bacterial culture. Have you ever wondered how did it cause complete hemolysis? And the answer is, it's because it has hemolysin or streptolysin. I cause hemolysis, full hemolysis, complete hemolysis. And the streptococcus has two types of streptolysin or hemolysin. There is streptolysin S and streptolysin O. ASO test is measuring the antibodies against streptolysin O, anti-streptolysin O antibodies. Because remember, to diagnose bacteria in general, we rely on microscopy, culture, nucleic acid tests, identification, and detection. Sometimes I'm trying to detect the bacterial antigen, and sometimes I'm trying to detect my antibodies against that antigen. The story of looking for the ASO and the DNAs is the story of detecting my antibody against the bacterial antigens. There is also a test called anti-M protein antibody. As for anti-DNAs B, it's the same story. It's just less reliable than ASO. So when should I order anti-DNAs? You can order it together with ASO or you can wait until ASO comes back. If ASO comes back positive, you have your diagnosis. If it came back negative and you still suspect rheumatic fever, then do anti-DNAs B. Again, this is in addition to the Jones criteria. All of this is true for rheumatic fever, but what if I have another disease? Let's say I have streptococcus pyogenes causing pyoderma or skin infection. The cholesterol in the skin lipids can actually inhibit streptolysin O, which means my body will never see this streptolysin O antigen. Therefore, my body will not develop antibodies against streptolysin O. So if I have pyoderma or skin infection caused by strept, anti-DNAs is going to be more helpful than ASO because the cholesterol in the skin is going to inhibit the development of the hemolysin antigen. So let's review. In rheumatic fever, ASO is more reliable than anti-DNAs B. However, in pyoderma caused by streptococcus, anti-DNAs is more reliable than ASO. How do we treat rheumatic fever? Penicillin. What if I'm allergic? Then use erythromycin. You can learn about penicillin, erythromycin, cephalosporins, vancomycin, all the antibacterials, antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitic medications by downloading my antibiotics course at medicosisperfectionatus.com. To learn about the different types of shock, like cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, neurogenic shock, septic shock, etc., download my surgery high yields course at medicosisperfectionatus.com. To learn about cardiac arrhythmias, angina, MI, ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, ARDS, diabetic ketoacidosis, and much more, download my emergency medicine high yields at medicosisperfectionatus.com. And to master antiarrhythmics, antihyperlipidemics, antihypertensives, diuretics, and digoxin medications, download my cardiac pharmacology course. There are more than 300 premium videos available on this channel if you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click the join button. You can support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you'd like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense.